Hello, welcome to Fine Art Stage 2 of uh, Session 2 about our dealer and preparation classes. Today we're going to talk about Aerovane. This is a very important subject because this is the second piece of product we come up with and then it's the second pattern I owned. Now what's so special about Aerovane? It's just a vein, right? For arrows. Let's talk about a little bit history about how arrow come by. You know, until before 1960, nearly all veins are feathers. Okay, compound bow is really not a big deal, but we are looking at arrow speed of 160 to 200 feet per second. As speed of the arrow increases, we start using plastic, which is a little bit simpler. It's more even. You go to about 100 and 200 to 230 feet per second, somewhere around there. Then by about 210, things really start to change because see, all of a sudden, we start seeing arrow over the 260 feet per second mark. People say, oh, wait a minute. In 2000, I got bow that shoot at 310 feet per second. I say, yes, you do. But that is on an IBO, on a non-hunting arrow. It takes a lot of effort to reach that speed. In order, not like today, nearly today, every single bow you bought, if you have a decent arrow with a right weight, like an IBO record, you will exceed 300 feet per second. And this is where our vein come into play. Now, Aerovin was first designed in 2007, but it really do not become a mainstay until in, after 2010 and onwards. Because this is about 213 to 14 is where we really see it take off. Because people are actually shooting over 260 feet per second. Yes, by 2008, there is some crossbow that shoot over 400 feet per second. But most people don't know how to manipulate correctly. The projectiles are not really doing the stuff, the spine is too weak and so on. But in today, we finally see a lot of crossbow actually shoot over 480 feet per second, which we are talking close to 330 miles per hour. At that speed, all the traditional veins really don't work very well. Why do they not very well? Now let's talk about what's going on. Now first of all, I want to talk about the difference between what an arrow vein does and what does a traditional vein does. You see, first of all, in the case of arrow vein, by the way, this is arrow vein 2 on an on a arrow boat with four vein configuration. You see that? That's an, actually an airfoil in here. It is a basic delta, a delta wing design. In the case of arrow wing 3, it's a winglet based delta wing design. What is these two design? have similarity and difference, we'll talk about it in a few other slides. But I want to emphasize what was Bose arrow vein or any arrow vein we ever come up with. What are the main characteristics of it? The first thing is that it is an airfoil-based system. In other words, instead of using a typical drag system to rotate, we use lift. I'll go into very detail what lift means, okay? Then we want to talk about the regional surface texturing. Now this is actually, I was surprised and Intrigued how much we do not know in the case of the Aerovin. On Aerovin 1 and the original Aerovin 2, I spent extra money in polishing this surface to make sure they're super smooth. But guess what? After my talk with Professor Salik, I was told it's the totally exactly opposite of what I need. So after that, I learned about surface texturing. And of course, Aerovin 3, the surface texturing is significantly improved. And I will show you how it improved in the features in the next slide. And the third thing, this is a big word, aerodynamic elasticity memory. This is what makes Aerovin 2 and especially Aerovin 3 such a big deal. And I have a really detailed explanation about aero elasticity, aerodynamic elasticity memory and we, what it does to a projectile with the veins on it and what it does in crosswind and high speed. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about flight. Because see, at the end of the day, the arrow still need to fly, right? Now this is an arrow bow 3 with the arrow wing 2 on it. And I will show you what it does. What is drag? Now everybody understand that at low speed, we're using the effect of drag to rotate an arrow. That's what everybody does, that's what most of the arrow does when they are low speed. A drag is a mechanical force acting opposite to the relative motion of a solid object moving through a liquid. In this moment, the liquid is the air. And the solid is this. This is a solid. So the moment when this thing flies through the air, the force that slows it down is called the drag. Now what is rotation? Rotation is this, this angle. See the blue arrow? 
Now imagine this is the arrow. It rotates this way. For those who have not know, do not know arrow vane. You see the bulge right here? That's the direction the arrow is going to turn. So this is the rotation of the arrow. What is the rotational drag? The rotational drag is the opposite force that apply to the rotation. So you see, remember we say opposite to the relative motion of solid. The motion of this arrow is clockwise, viewing from the back, and the drag is counterclockwise. This relationship is reasonably well used when the arrow is not exceeding 260 feet per second. Now what happened? The speed is slow. These two things are manageable. The moment when we have big speed, that means over 260 feet per second. That's the starting point. 315, you really see its effect. And anything over it, I couldn't say more because it's just so dramatic. You can see that the rotation is getting less and less. That's the reason you find out a lot of people who have slow, low, have high speed camera will find out. The moment you hit 260, 280 feet per second, all the way to 500 feet per second, the rotation of the arrow, do, the rotate revolution of an arrow on a, on a fixed distance, 20 yard, do not change. That means if you hit 12, 8 to 12 frame revolution, at say 260 feet per second, you use the same thing at 400 feet per second, you still are going to get about 8 to 12 feet per second. So wow, that is how significantly the drag increases as the speed increases. Then what? We now said about the increases now. We want to talk about airfoil. The moment you talk about airfoil, you need to understand or at least give a rough crash course on the Bernoulli principle. The Bernoulli principle is how when air speed over fluid, the surface pressure change. This is actually all about airfoil and we want to talk about it a little bit more. You can see that as the wing, you see that this surface right here, as the surface go over this, see this larger surface compared to this smaller surface? No, but this is not a larger, that's the wrong word, it's a longer surface compared to a shorter surface. As the surface distance increases, so does the airspeed. When the airspeed increases, the pressure on the that surface is less. And the pressure going on the, on the shorter surface is more. So shorten distance, less speed, more pressure. Longer distance, more speed, less pressure. The difference between these two is left. You can see that. So the resulting of just forcing this, this sort of structure, passing through a liquid, which in case case air, you got left. But that's pretty good, isn't it? Because you don't have to apply anything to it. Just by passing it through air, you got left. In other words, this piece is going to go up to this direction just by passing itself through the air. Now what does that mean? Well, if you look at it, this is looking at an oxide or aerobow 3. You can see that three surface of the, I mean, of course, this bulge is on this side, which is the correct side. You're looking from the knock side. The moment you do that, this is the lift for each vein. See this vein, this is the lift, right? Most people think, now when you have three lift, what's going to happen? The arrow is going to turn like this way. Isn't that what we want? You see, what about well, if you turn like this, where's the drag? Well, most people think the drag is this. <laughs> you know what? The beauty of the airfoil is that the moment you put an airfoil, this is where the drag is. That is called the induced drag. Guess which way it's pointing at? It's pointing in the same direction as lift. So it's just like, remember, the people say, why is round so great? Because when you push a wheel, the drag is the direction you want to push it. So this is very much like a round wheel. The drag is on your benefit, just like the lift. So what is the resulting drag? That's the induced drag. So everything pointing this way. Now we get more interesting. When we have all the things facing together, what do you get? You now get a perfect circular lift. It is not a drag induced rotation. It is actually a circular lift. So what kind of energy are we wasting here? None. Technically none. 
It's approaching to none as possible. Okay, now we, we talk about the airfoil. The next thing we're gonna talk about is texture. The reason I didn't put anything on because I want you to thought, think about it. Remember the golf ball effect a lot of you talk about? Do you know that if you have a golf ball that's perfectly polished, when you, when you hit it, it's gonna go towards the right and fall down real fast? Because of the surface texture. It was that big of a deal. You literally would you, you shorten your distance by about a third to half just by making sure the ball is perfectly round with no dimples on it. The dimples on the ball is called surface texturing. For some of you who really understand marine, marine science and so on, you notice that the shark, fins, shark skin is not smooth. It got texture on it. It's also zoned. Now, let's talk about what this is about. Now, first of all, I want to show you. This is called different level of micro texturing. This is a large texturing and small texturing, okay? This is a tip and this is called a space. This space is where air is gonna hide. The larger this space, the better. But first of all, you need to understand, we are talking space that is in 4,000 to 15,000 of a, uh, 15 millions of a millimeter. So this is tiny, tiny, tiny. This is not, a, I mean, we are talking about the surface the texture on this. So you are talking tiny, tiny pieces because we are dealing a lot more higher speed now. So the texture itself is also a lot more complicated. But this is what happens. See this? That's called the surface boundary layers. See this area? This is actually the air is going to circular right this. When the air hit it, the air is going to circle itself right here, right here, right here to counter the effect of it. So the texture zone will help the air to travel. The larger it is, the traveling of it is smoother. Then you move into lower area. Well, what are we talking here? Let's put our piece and show you what it is. See, in, when we first designed Aerovin 2, we have three surface texture layer. Because I did not understand this well. So you notice that 40, 200, 201, and 150, 150 UM. So this space, this space is the heaviest, medium, and lightest. So imagine this part is equal to this part, this part equal to this part. So when the air goes through it, we minimize the maximum turbulence here and we'll smooth it out and force the air to touch the surface. We'll talk about this, why is this so important? Okay, this is extremely critical because if we don't have this surface texturing, this whole area would be very, very difficult to man man maneuver. And when we go into aerodynamic elasticity memory, you will see what's going to happen right here. Now remember this zone right here. And as we learn more about aerodynamics, well guess what? You notice that in the case of Aerowing 3, I actually got Professor Sek to explain what is the most important. And this is the diagram he draw me. He said the most part that need the heaviest texture is on the winglet. I say not here, I say no, the winglet. And then he could try to give me a lot of information, believe me, I couldn't grasp it. But who am I to ask? When I have an advisor would teach me this, he say, this is the best. Here I am, this is the best. So the airflow is coming like this, and it going like this. This is the thinnest part. And we actually, after we learn so much, we add another texture zone, which is this texture. It's close to, it's close to totally flat. What we want is that we want the air to suck down to this surface. So where do you want to suck down to this surface? Well, this is where the next section gets in real interesting. Aerodynamic elastic memory. This is a very big word. Now we're talking about, first of all, let's talk about terminology. Because without terminology, we can't go into description of what aerodynamic elasticity memory do, does. First of all, let's talk about the five main terms in an airfoil, especially this is a delta wing airfoil. The first thing you want to talk about, this is where the leading edge of this delta wing. That means the moment it, the air hit, this is where the air hit it. That's the reason it's called the leading edge. Now, as we already know, the air is, the arrow is going to rotate this way, right? So the leading edge is technically hitting the air at 90 degree, which is about as bad as it gets, isn't it? Remember, the air is turning this way, and this surface is hitting the air underneath it, which means it hit it at 90 degree. Now, in the case, let me use this and show you. So as it moves forward, it's going to hit the air this way. This is the leading edge, leading edge, and the air is going to hit this way. And then the moment it hits, guess what? You got an angle of attack, 
which now this is become the angle of the attack at this moment is 90 degree. As we all know, 90 degree of anything towards moving forward is the worst thing you can possibly get. The next thing you underneath it since is, is, is 90 degree underneath it is where the delta vortex. Now, delta vortex is good because it gives you a delta vortex lift on this surface. And finally, now this is the residual vacuum bubble. This is where the low texture come in. Because by, by doing a residual vacuum bubble, if we do not have the low texture, like this airfoil, the air will go over this. See the distance of travel from this point to this point is actually less. But with the, with the low texture, the air will suck down to this and travel. So now you've got the longest distance. And also to mention, see the moment we have the residual bubble, if it, the whole thing is polished, the air will go through this and goes on. This become a vacuum bubble right here, which means the resulting is going to suck the vein from this side up. So this vein will actually move backwards like this using the residual bubble. And finally, the trailing vortex. Well, anybody who drove on highway notice why the, all the big truck would do long haul have those fins. What I did try to prevent, the trailing vortex. Well, you see, this is all the features on it, but what does aerodynamic elasticity memory does? Oh, we do some wonderful stuff. Now, I'm going to use this piece because this is the only piece I can show you what it does. Now, assuming the bulge is on this side, okay? Just like this, sorry, the bulge is on this side. The moment lift is applied on this side, with the aerodynamic elasticity memory, guess what? This thing is going to behave like this. Take a closer look, it's going to bend like this way. All of a sudden, this leading edge angle, the leading edge and the angle of attack is reduced, which increased the delta vortex. And at the same time, you also smooth out this area, which you minimize the residual vacuum. And because this is now turning this way, the traveling vortex is less. Because all of a sudden, instead of a straight plane, it is now become a, a part, of the, part of the impeller system. It is not a propeller, it's an impeller. So all of a sudden, all five things that we concerned with all go towards the end we want instead of reducing it. You say, that's wonderful, but how do you know? Well, I don't really know. That's the reason I ask people to help. See, based on the material science of this, this end, there's a D92 material. I asked Professor Sedek, she spent about 22 hours to give me the model which give me the aspect ratio of thickness, hardness, which I give him the D22, and this is the shape. By the way, this is a thin pyramid shape. So every part of it, when you finish with it, this piece is gonna behave like this. Now what does that really mean? That means this piece of plastic have the intelligence to know that when it, the speed goes, it will flex itself more and yawn itself more to form the best airfoil to form this impeller. This is where the big deal about this aerodynamic electricity memory. Which, let me give you some numbers so you got some idea how serious it gets. Aerovin 2 at 400 feet per second is going to do 120 revolution from 60 to 80 yards. Aerovin 3, which is the one with the winglet, our last high-speed camera test, based on the distance that we have from 60 to 80 yards at 425 feet per second, is doing 300 plus revolution from 60 to 80 yards, compared to 8 to 12 turns on a blazer. It sounds great, but we're going to go even further and tell you how wonderful this Air Force does. Now, you say, well, if it's rotating that fast, wouldn't you lose energy? Wouldn't you cause a lot of turbulence? The answer to all the above is no. <laughs> because it's actually, in the case, I'm going to show you what the result we got. If you use a traditional big vein, a long vein, shooting at 315 feet per second. Now, that's the number we use most of the time because that's where it breaks off into the aerodynamic zone. A traditional four, vein, four inch vein, two and a half degree offset at 315 feet per second. The moment the structure going through a wind, say blowing normally with no structure, it showed me it disturbed about 18 inch in diameter. That means when a traditional arrow going through a space, a column of 18 inch about this spec is being disturbed. 
That's the reason it's called a crosswind signature. That's the signature of that arrow, the moment it goes through the air. A typical uh, four inch feather will give you nine inch that's helically fudged. And in the case of strict fudge, even like a blazer, you're looking at three inch. That means a column of air about this spec is being disturbed. And what we discovered, an arrow wing two at 315 feet per second is about two inch, an arrow wing three is only one to one and a half inch. So we are talking a column air of this spec all the way to column air of this spec. As you can imagine, if you got crosswind, a no matter what the wind from from left to right or right to left, if you got a structure of about this spec, remember we're dealing with subsonic, not supersonic, okay? Supersonic, your arrow is way away. The trail of air don't matter. We are still doing it. The faster we got, it's about 300 plus feet per second, by miles per hour. We're no longer near 700. Maybe one day we need to deal with that, but right now we're in subsonic. So the crosswind signature is, fin is important. Now you can see why the arrow wing is so efficient, because see, you can actually shoot arrow wing in crosswind and ignore it. Our typical example from our customer is that with arrow wing 2, you can do 110 to 120 yards with 30 miles per hour wind and ignore it because it hit within that one inch group, as long as you can hold it steadily. That's a very, very big deal. Now, in summary, I want to talk about arrow wing 2 and arrow wing 3 so you can see the difference between these two and why one is better than the other in some application. By the way, one is not better than the other, is one is, is more suitable for each of the situation. Now, arrow wing 2 and arrow wing 3. Arrow wing 2 on the tip is 12 millimeter or 0 0.55, and arrow wing 3 is only 0.393 or 10 millimeters. You can see we designed everything using metric, but we convert it back to SAE for your information. Arrow wing 2, the reason it's heavier because we went through the lawsuit, we redo the surface, so arrow wing 2 is thicker. But thicker means it's more rigid. Remember, this whole thing is based on aerodynamic elasticity memory design. So originally, it's much thinner than it is. So it's a lot more flexible. But after the resurfacing, it's real more rigid. Well, that actually is good. I want to talk about that a little bit later. The third thing is that they are both custom airfoil with pretty much identical airfoil. You notice that the, this space right here from this point to this point and this point to this point is identical. The only difference is that, see the winglet right here? That's what arrow wing 3 got. And arrow wing, just like when we talk about textures, you can see that in arrow wing 2, there's three texture zones, and in arrow wing 4, there's arrow wing 3, there's four texture zones. But being more rigid, that means you have more control. Arrow wing 2, around 315 feet per second or below, you can use most of the broadhead that's under one inch. The moment you go to arrow wing 3, because first of all, this is not a rigid, airfoil. It's a very, it's aerodynamic, elasticity memory tuned airfoil. So the spin rate is extremely high. And that is not good for broadhead, or most of the broadhead. So you can see the difference. We are talking a close to it, although there's only 20% difference in diameter, or in height, but in, uh, in diameter on the, on, the, uh, on the crossing signature, but in actuality, it's nearly doubled. Remember, it's 1.25 divided by 2 squared times, times pi. So you can see the numbers. It's nearly doubled. Finally, what are they common? They both are the same size, exactly length, 1.967 inch. They both use 92 drum meter plastic. They seem the exact run, the front edge right here is identical in the aspect ratio, which is a copy of the American Big Bang House wing. That's the reason it's so quiet. And finally, they use the same slim pyramid design. The ratio is 100% identical. The only difference is that this is thicker because the, seconds, the, the second remoting of the surface. Well, for the people who would like to know, this is the 12 color we currently offer in Aeroving 2 and Aeroving 3. Now, what does that mean? You see that when you look at this the packaging with you, see the word A means Aeroving, the word C means 100. If you see the word V here, that means it's 18 pack. And this two means arrow wing two or arrow wing three. And last character, L means red. Now, for those who may not know, the black is not B. Blue is B. Black is K. Otherwise, you have two B. <laughs> this is same exact number than uh, a numer uh, what you call it, uh, coding system as resistor. K means black. So you have clear, white, black, red. Okay, it's C, W, K, L, P, O. Why? This is line, 
This is mint, this is green, blue, and finally violet. Those are the 12 colors. Okay, we already know how special Aerovin 2, Aerovin and 2 and Aerovin 3 is. It is so precise. How can we all, how we just put it together? Well, we tried. We, we first, when we first come in 2007 to 2008, when we first come up with it, we, we tell people using a Bison burger and glue a 116 inch square bar on the lower side of the, of the strict flutch on the magnet side. That didn't work. Because we find out that the index chuck of the bits is very inaccurate. So it is not unusual. Just by flopping a basic 204 shaft, you can get up to as, as little as three degree, as much as 17 degree error per arrow. And in the case of Aerovin 2, you need about no more than one and a half degree to maybe two degree max, or else the airfoil is not being stable. The mo the, actually, the circular lift is not stable because the airfoil is pointing at different directions. In the case of Aerovin 3, because it's ultra high speed, we need it to be no more than one degree. Ideally, half a quarter degree is what we're looking for. Now, so what does that mean? Which means that we have no choice but to make the Aerovin jig. The Aerovin jig comes out two years after the Aerovin because we tried everything. We even, we even uh, so we recommend people using seamless, seamless conversion on a Bissenberger jig. But that only addressed some of the issue. The fact is that the, the Bissenberger claim is made of pewter. The entire surface pressure towards the veins are never even. So we go ahead and bite the bullet and actually make the Aerovin jig, which you can see is a full CNC machine. You've got dual ceramic ball bearing with a, with a saconium ball indexing on an on a aluminum oxide, which is considered a ceramic surface for indexing. Now, what does that mean? That means if you use this jig to flush an arrow, you have plus and minus a 170 second of a degree accuracy. If you reflush it using one vein off, using an index for reflushing, you cannot be more than a quarter degree off. Which means that if you use this, a quarter degree is all you got if you use this correctly. Now for 2020, see this is updated for 2020. You see this part right here? That's called the bump. This bump is added because a lot of people in the target entry, especially in 3D, start shooting a lot of 2764 arrow. And when you use it, now let me put an Aerovin jig so you can see what I mean by that. This is the older Aerovin jig. The moment you do 2764, this is hitting above it. That means you can't get a reference point. So we raise this area by adding this bump. So it's much easier for you to do 24, 2764 arrows. All the rest are the same. It's no, I mean, we come out with a good piece, there's no reason to change, and we didn't. The Aerovin clamp again have not changed since 2008. A lot of people say, well, you know how, how durable it is. This whole play piece is made of, four to, uh, is made of uh, 304 stainless steel, which is not magnetic. So we had to physically machine the magnet side away and bed a piece of steel, re-machine it, so it can give you the capability of the magnet. At the same time, we want to make sure this surface, these two surfaces, which is flat, we are perfectly, perfectly matched. So after this is made with, with these two ceramic ball bearing, we close it and we polish the front surface to be no more than five millionth of an inch. Yes, five millionth of an inch. Why so critical? Because if you look at this piece, that's the vein. See the vein is on it? A lot of people think that we're using this surface to push down on the vein. No, we do not. This is not where it is important. The important thing is this 90 degree. This is what the vein is being pushed down. Okay, why so critical? Let me give you some numbers so you understand how big this deal is. On a, on a typical Bissenberger, with the Bissenberger helical clamp, using bonding platinum plus glue, the average vein has 0.8 to 1.5 grain of glue on it. Wait a minute, don't you just say 0 0.8 to 1.5, that's over 50% variance. I think that's exactly right. That's 50% variance the moment you put a vein on it. That means if you put three veins, the best case scenario, you've got about 2.4 grain and the worst case about 4.5 grain. 
So what's so special about Elvin Clam and if you decide to use Elvin glue with it? If you use the OHO 600, which is 600 center point glue, and you put the vein on it, the moment you put the glue and you force down, because this whole surface is acting on the tangent of the surface of the shaft, average glue on it is 0 0.03 grain per vein. That means when you put three veins on it, the total weight should not exceed 0 0.1 grain. Did you not say the other one takes 2.4 to 4.5 grains and you take 0 0.1? I said yes. So the difference, even in this best case scenario, is 240 times the glue. Now you know why, I mean, back in the days when I was using that whole system, I'll be lucky to get two dozen arrows out of a two ounce tube. But in the case of the Aerovin AGO 600 being less than 27 grain, I can do 60 to 80 dozens of arrow with one bottle. Now, what other accessory you put on it to make it right? See, we've got a four-way adjustable neck. See that is one axis, two axis, three axis, four axis turn. And for the people who do a lot of work in the older system, we have the production neck, which made of stainless steel. By the way, both of them will mount on our plate. You see there's three holes right here? The two holes from the production neck will go on here, and the four-way adjust neck will go in the middle, which will give you the result of that. It is a very sophisticated piece of machinery, and yes, it is definitely not cheap. The basic setup like that, you're looking above, uh, 300, about 400 bucks. But for all the dealers who already use it, I don't have to tell you how much this is worth it. Now, for the configurations. When we first started Aerovin Jake, we give you 0, 120, 180, and 240. We found out that's too confusing. So now we only have two configurations. That's the three index, one, 0, 120, 240, and we have the seven index, which is 0, 60, 90, 120, 180, 240, and 270. This is the configuration most people use if you ever fudge more than three veins or two veins. Because with two veins, you can do 0, 180, Three veins again, 0, 120, 240. On four veins, it's 0, 90, 180, 240. But on a tech 15, you know it's bow tie. So at that moment, what do you do? You index your arrow at 120 degrees first, and you rotate to 0, 60. Do your first left vein, and 180, 240 for your right vein. So now you've got a bow tie with a 120 at your center. Do, can you do a six vein? I highly recommend you don't because it's never going to be really good. And then, of course, uh, on the configuration of the Aerovin jig, we got three plus one hooks. This is to handle the basic crossbow 300 size, 244 size, and 204 size. Now, if you go, and go above and beyond this or use multiple, the adjustable is the best. This actually got a flange bobbing on the bottom and lets you move to fudge 124,000 all the way to 2764. So if you use anything over 300, anything under 204 or close to 166, you're better off with the adjustable uh, hook. With the adjustable hook, say, how do I know the, this is perfectly leveled? That's how you do it. Let me bring up an aerovane jig and show you with the water level. The moment you're able to level this, this piece, Okay, the moment you put the water level on it, you make sure this piece matches this piece by adjusting the adjustable chuck, adjustable hook knob. You're able to make this arrow perfectly leveled. People say, why do I care? I remember the old Bissenberger is sticking up so far. But, but remember, at that time, you're using a boning platinum plus or every, or most of the glue that's resin based, which means the glue is not fluid. That means you're using a lot of it, and you do squeeze it and press it out. The moment you use CA glue with Sana Acolyte on a low center ploy, like 600 center ploy, or even some people prefer the 15 center ploy, which is extremely, extremely fluid, you're going to need that surface to be perfectly leveled because you don't want it to flow to one end or the other. Okay, we handle the top of the arrow now, we've got the bottom of the arrow on the chuck. We now make nine, nine shapes. Seven of them is specific size. And yes, we discontinue the adjustable chuck. It, it comes out in 2008, but 2014 we decided to discontinue it. Because most people do not understand what the adjustable chuck is for and they misuse it in the point that they actually break it. 
The adjustable chuck is meant for refletching of one vein, not to fletch an arrow from scratch. Because if you do that, this three prong had to maintain constant pressure, which it could not. This is not the, how the thing was designed. And so and so few of you got it, we finally decided to just discontinue it and stuck with. Just like, imagine this is your crescent wrench, this is your soccer set. Do you really want to use a crescent wrench when you have the soccer set? Answer is absolutely not. Now, a lot of people say, wait a minute, the, I, I, I cut off O-ring all the time. See this O-ring right here? See, that's, this every single piece is tapered. And let's use a 204 as example, okay? This is the 204 chuck right here. That means if you're an arrow, that's 242, you're gonna stop right here. When you're an arrow, that's 246, you're gonna stop it here. At 250, you just barely touch the bottom. So technically, every single one of the chuck have a, a range. Like this is 204 to 246, or actually closer to 250. This is 201 to 205. This is 230 to 237. And this one is 315 exact. But you can maybe do a 317 but nobody make a 317 arrow. Then what is this too? This is called the knock chuck, and this is called the pin chuck. This actually is tempered. So this piece behave like spring. It's gonna grab the pin of the pin knock chuck, the pin knock pin, grab it like this, and it will fudge it and very steadily. And people say, why can't I just go ahead and bend the knock chuck? This is where the problem with the knock, as you, as you learn from the session one, we are the only one make the knot exactly the same width. But what happens when you go to crossbows? The distance of every single knot is different. So why do you still make this? Because we got customers who still shoot the old Mako knot, which is grew on a cone of a piece of aluminum. After you glue it, that's the only way to fudge it. That's the reason we make this thing, this space right here, 112,000. That means you can squeeze a 0 0.098 all the way to 115. It will work on it reasonably well. So we cover some, but not all. What other accessory we got for Aeroving Jake? We got the dip bottles. Now people say, why do you need three? And this is the time I want to go into a little bit about chemistry and how you deal with an arrow. When you first got an arrow like this, how clean the surface? I can tell it's not clean because they basically have a, a few people have touched it. So there's oil, there's everything on it. So that's the reason you cut three bottles and you should name them. The dip, the rinse, and the fudge. So when you first got arrow, you throw in the arrow called the dip. So the moment you dip it, you take away the oil. But this bottle is still reasonably dirty. So the second part you're putting in the rinse bottle. So you dip it a second time and go through the rinse bottle. Now your surface should be clean. And now you put it on your arrow vein jig and try your best not to touch this surface where your vein is going to go. Then you use what you call it, the flush bottle. You take the cap off and then you make sure the valve, you as long as fill up to this level and now clean your vein. Now when you clean the vein, again, make sure it's Q-tip from front to back, dipped, dry from front to back. You don't want to go backwards because then about two or three arrows, the veins, you throw that Q-tip and get a new one. Because the end of the Q-tip with acetone, you're gonna pick up every single dirt right here. You see, the thing is clean, what do you mean by dirt? Now remember, this is an extruded airfoil. This is not an extruded, but a molded airfoil. That is release agent inside this material. The moment you put acetone, you flow the, re you flow the release agent into the acetone. And as you clean it, you got a perfect clean surface that you can put your CA glue on, which is your, like an AGO 600. You are now able to go into where the release agent used to be. Now remember, the release agent is pulled away from the plastic, so there is literally holes in it. Your glue is now going onto the holes. So it's gripping it perfectly. And anybody who tell you the arrow shaft surface is polished, uh, you have not seen a microscope. It's porous like crazy. So the moment you put it on, guess what? You got place to grip, and you got place to grip, and you bond the two together perfectly. As a matter of fact, you know, if you look at quite a few videos, the moment you put the arrow vein onto a shaft, within nine seconds, it takes 650 to 680 pounds to put it off. It's that much power. So now you know why we have three bottles of acetone. 
The next thing we're talking about is Aerovin case. But well, this is a case that we designed. It's a really nice case. You should really show your customers how this case works. And I'll show you. See that? The case actually is two in one case. You can, there's a middle zipper. The moment you put the middle zipper apart, you end up with two parts. This is all your heavy stuff. Your laser, your, uh, your base, your neck goes here. And the rest go here. So that means if you do expedition, all the stuff you need is in this side of the case. Your jig, your clam, your, your extra vein, your, clay, your one bottle, because when you're traveling, you're not going to bring three. In this, so you end up with really nicely handling case. And the next accessory is the laser. Now again, a lot of people confused. The laser is to help you to reflush. You say, well, if I have one thing off, how do I find it? Remember, you have a super accurate index right here. So you use, for example, you've got three veins. So you take that vein off with a knife, and you, you clean the rest of the vein using, an acid, using a cotton ball soaked with acetone to wipe off whatever glue you got. Then you use the laser to match the next vein. After you match the next vein, you take, then you take the clam away, you do a rotation, you're now plus and minus within half a degree. That's a big improvement instead of taking all three. Because at the end of the day, if you pre-index your arrow on the last time, and you check the end index is within the same range, why would you want to take all three veins off to just fudge it? And of course, for the people who like to use our jig, on some people, some older veins, that's four inch or six inch feather, obviously this time is not gonna work. It's only four inch right here. So we give you a long feather adapter so you can extend this part higher so you got a clearance surface of six inches. So now you can do a six inch feather without any issue. Finally, go back to the AGO 600. The reason it's called AGO 600 is called, is Aerovin glue, it's 600 cent deploy. And you notice we everyone have a date in it. Because see, unlike other company, our glue have no stabilizer in it. That means the moment we finally make it into the bottle, from the time we make it, that's about 12 months in room temperature it will survive. After that, it will turn hard. Would it turn hard earlier? Absolutely. Because see, like one time we got a badge or a bottle that got sunshine on the sun and become bad. That's the reason notice that everyone have a batch number here. This is the batch number that we, we, super, we all copied from the production run that come to us. We only put the date of that run on this bottle. So you know exactly when, what date, what is being made, how it's being made through this number. Then say, wow, that's pretty involved. But say, in order to get a glue in this caliper, all the steps must be taken or else it's not, you're not going to get a fresh glue with, with it. And you notice that this is actually a lure lock system. It's the same thing that everybody use in IVs. See, the lure lock allows you to remove this cap and put this thing on every time and it's airtight. This is the same system people in IVs use in all needles or any time you want to connect a small tube surface close, as close to effortlessly airtight as possible. Now you notice this is actually a 22 gauge stainless steel needle. That's a very good control. Now for people who say, well, you know why you only give me one? Because see, with one of the nip needle tip, if you take care of it, see the moment you use it, you make sure you squeeze the bottle backwards, suck the air through it, you got air through this part, you can sit this bottle in open air for about three days without clocking. So one bottle is going to last you at least a month. I mean, one tip. And then you can change to another tip, another tip, another tip. And sometimes when you put the bottle in production sideways, you're going to damage this part. We also sell this piece too. It's called a cap. So yeah, you can see we really take a lot of effort to make sure when you as a dealer in production environment, we give you every single possible consumer part while give you super accuracy for maintenance. That pretty much concludes the entire Aerovane. Any question, email me, text me, all right?